The Lord be with you. And also with you. So good to be with all of you today on this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to worship and want to welcome our online congregation as well and pray God's uh, blessings upon you. Uh, had uh, a week away last Sunday. I was down in uh, Melbourne, uh, Vieira area celebrating my aunt's 100th birthday. And I was in another uh, LCMS congregation on, on Sunday morning. There was a great celebration on Friday evening and Saturday and with the family reunion. And then to be able to come together as a family and, and worship, to commune together, we took up four rows in the congregation. Um, but it's good to be back with my, my Bethlehem family as well. And then uh, on Monday, uh, I flew to St. Louis for a theological symposium on uh, technology and the church, or, or theology and AI, and both the, uh, the curses of that, the dangers of that, but also uh, some of the blessings that, that we might be able to, to learn from that. It was very informative, but also I have to t admit, in total honesty, about half of it went right over my head. Um, today, Pastor Nate was talking about uh, merch and what's the other one? Swag. And swag. I'm learning a whole new language. That uh, that's why I love having the young guys, having Pastor Nate and have having Vicar here because they're teaching me this new language. And I, I'm trying, but I honestly I have to ask for help. <laughs> but merch and swag. Pastor Nate will tell you about that in just a minute. Um, and then went to a, a vicarage supervisors uh, conference at the end of the week at the same campus, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Um, and God willing, it looks like we'll have a, another uh, vicar at the end of this year. Um, just Bethlehem is such a blessing to these young, young men who are preparing for the office of the Holy Ministry. And I also was able to see uh, Vicar Sean and, and Fiona and Seamus, and they're looking forward to being back here for our 75th anniversary. So uh, that's really fantastic that they're going to come and join us for that. Also, the new members class. Uh, there are 32 that have signed up, uh, and now we are offering child care. So if there's anyone here who said, you know, I can't go because I've got to watch the, the children, uh, there's child care available, and if you are able to come, we'd love to have you in the class. I'm just asking you to sign up for the class uh, so that I have enough materials for everybody. But it's going to be a great opportunity for you to get to know me better as new members, for me to get to know you, and, and to be able to welcome you into the church. So I'm looking forward to that, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, three consecutive Wednesdays, the 2nd, the 9th, and the 16th from 6.30 until 8.00. Those are my announcements, Pastor Nate. Thanks for holding down the fort. You're quite welcome. My pleasure. Um, thanks for coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, merch and, and swag are technically different. I shouldn't have used swag. Swag is stuff we all get, and typically swag is like free. So when you go to the you know, the stuff, and they just throwing you stuff. That's swag, and this really isn't swag. This is merch. Like I said, that's way over yeah, my head. So, <laughs> but if you have uh, merch, the, there are tumblers are in. If you came in this way, you already saw it, but the table is out there in the courtyard for one last day today because if you want to have your Bethlehem shirt or cap by the time we have our big celebration, um, today is the deadline for submitting those orders, so everything is here. Uh, we'll have a few items probably just to, to have extra on hand and sell during the event, but if you want to wear it then, Today's your deadline, so stop by the booth if it's presumably still there on, your, on our way out. Um, oh, Pastor and I and Vicar, uh, who we should probably say a word about. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. get at it. Pastor and I and Vicar will be at uh, Pastor's Conference, the Florida Georgia District Conference, tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning. Uh, that happens uh, regularly, and we're supposed to go, and we should go, because it's good, and it's, it's helpful, and all that. So, you want to talk about Vicar? Yeah, well, Vicker's not here, so we can talk about him. Uh, he, he's actually hiding out behind the pulpit. Uh, he went to a wedding last week, not his own, somebody else's, um, and he came back with COVID. Good news is uh, he tested negative yesterday, but out of an abundance of caution, he's wearing a mask. Uh, he will not be wearing the mask during his sermon today, but he did test negative yesterday, and so we're just uh, we're putting him back in the corner. 
and um, he will not be greeting at the door. But we're just thankful that you're doing better, Vicar, and that you're here today to bring us God's gifts. <laughs> I'm also learning sign language. Yeah. <laughs> A couple other events real quick. This Friday is family game night at 5.30, so food and uh, bring, a, uh, bring your family, bring a game. If you bring your game, maybe write your name on the, the box so we can keep clear whose is whose, and that kind of would, would help. But we had great turnout last month, and to feel free to join in, young and old. We have a good time. And then finally, I mentioned this last week, um, but it was just the first time you'd heard about it, so I want to keep uh, plugging away. Uh, the First Coast Circuit, our little kind of Jacksonville and greater area uh, congregations are working together to bring a Lutheran Hour speaker into our area and uh, talk to us and help us with Christian witness, Christian living, and, and what does it look like to, to bear witness to Christ in the days that we live in, which is different than it was 20 years ago. So uh, from the Lutheran Hour Ministries, Reverend Dr. Chad Leckies is coming. And he'll be speaking. This event is at Holy Cross. So, uh, so for some of you, you probably are closer there than you are to this congregation. It's just a few hours, Saturday the 12th, and you get a free lunch out of the deal. So sign up on the bulletin board. It will be a, a helpful presentation. I learned this week more of Dr. Leckie's story. So he wasn't a Christian 25 years ago. Uh, a lot has happened in 25 years. Uh, he he uh, became a Christian as an adult. And... Uh, then, in short order, became a Lutheran pastor, then got his uh, Ph.D. in uh, studying these kind of questions of Christianity and culture and society, because he was curious, what makes someone, how does someone like me come into the Christian faith f completely from outside? So, he'll be a great, uh, a great uh, asset, I think, so as many people as possible, we would love to get signed up for that, and there's a thing on the bulletin board, and I do need you to sign up by the 30th so we can have enough food. Sounds good. All right, we're here to worship. Please stand as we begin with our opening hymn, Open Now, Thy Gates of Beauty.
Amen. We would kneel as we are able for our confession. Let us confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, I confess all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. I have relied on my own strength to endure during temptation and persecution rather than your faithful protection. I am sorry for these my faults and ask your forgiveness and pardon that I may return your faithfulness with ongoing reliance of faith. In the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God grant deliverance from every trouble and set your feet to walk in his ways now and forever. Amen. Having heard those beautiful words of absolution, please stand as we continue singing, Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty. Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in the book of Jeremiah, the 11th chapter, where the prophet relies on God's protection as his opponents plot against him. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know it was against me. They devised schemes, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from the book of James, the third chapter, where the apostle proclaims God's peace, even as Christians struggle with inner warfare. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? 
You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us now join together, confess our holy Christian faith to one another, and with Christians throughout the world, in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated. <laughs>
grace, mercy, and peace are yours in Christ. Amen. In typical fashion, I have a question for you guys today. Who here desires to be the best? It, it's, it's not a trick question. It's okay. This is an okay question to answer, I promise. If there's nothing wrong with being the best. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best. Whether it be to be the best student in school, to be the best athlete on the court, or the smartest in your class. Nothing wrong with wanting to be the best worker at your job. Uh, climb up that corporate ladder, if you, will, if you would say that, or to stand out amongst your peers. There's nothing inherently wrong about wanting to be the best. And we see this desire to be the best in our Holy Gospel readings where the disciples argue with each other about who is the best. And it seems so random and out of the blue, and so I want to go back a little bit and talk about why it is they're even having this conversation. If we go all the way back to Mark chapter 9, we have two different stories. The story of the transfiguration and the demon-possessed boy. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to preach on all of those because that would be a really long sermon. So, and it's already a pretty long sermon, so I hope you guys are ready. Let's start with the transfiguration. We have some important characters in this story. We obviously have Jesus. That's a really important person in the story. He does the transfiguring. And we also have some celebrity cameos. We have Elijah and Moses. And out of the disciples, we only have three. Peter, James, and John. Now, I don't know why God, Jesus, didn't take all of them with him, but for whatever reason, he just chose those three, and it may look like favoritism on the surface. I personally think that Jesus is giving them the teacher treatment. Teachers, you know this. When you bring a student up to the front or right next to your desk, it's, it's not because they're your favorite. It's because they're the most problematic and need the most help. But that's my opinion. That's not biblical. But for whatever reason, it is just Peter, James, and John. And so I could imagine, I can hear Peter, James, and John talking to the other disciples and saying to them, we know something that you don't. Guess that means we're the best. Oh, that must have been irritating to hear. And to add more insult to injury, there's also the story of the demon-possessed boy. While Jesus and the three disciples are up on the mountain, a, a commotion starts happening at the bottom with the remaining disciples. A boy is brought before them with a demon and are asked to cast the demon out of the boy. And we know that the disciples actually have the ability to cast out demons from Mark chapter 6, but for whatever reason, they could not cast out this demon. And so Jesus and the three disciples come down from the mountain and Jesus sees what's going on and he casts the demon out of the boy. And the other disciples, the ones who were at the bottom of the mountain, come up to Jesus, possibly quite irritated, and say, why couldn't we cast this demon out? And Jesus tells them this demon could only come out through prayer. But I can imagine again, as Jesus is telling the remaining disciples this, Peter, James, and John, maybe arms crossed, have a smirk on their face. We've never had problems casting out demons. Guess that means we're the best. We see that these three get to see Jesus in his transfigured state, and the remaining disciples are embarrassed by the fact that they cannot cast this demon out of the boy. 
And that is what brings us to our story today. And all this angst and feeling of favoritism finally builds up to a head and sparks a conversation between the disciples on who is the best. And Jesus plays a little coy and he says, what were you guys talking about? I love when Jesus does this because it's Jesus, right? Jesus knows exactly what they're talking about. It's like the parent who, see, who goes up to their kid and says, did you take a cookie from the cookie jar? And the child says, no. And they have chocolate and cookie crumbs all over their face. The parent knows, and same with Jesus. The disciples have the figurative chocolate and cookie crumbs all over their face, and yet they answer with silence. And so Jesus puts on his teacher's hat and sits them down and tells them, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And it's really good that I wasn't a disciple back then because my smart mouth wants to answer with, what about those who just want to be in the middle? I don't think that would have flown well with Jesus. But, yet, but this may sound very familiar to you. It may sound like a text that you are more familiar with. The first will be last and the last will be first. And it is the same idea. And if you aren't uncomfortable with that yet, let me get you there. Because what Jesus is truly saying here is, if you desire to be spiritually first, you have to serve the least. And to explain this in a more clear and concise way, I am going to use pictures. Yep. These pictures are coined by uh, a college professor of mine, and he titles them Red Pyramid World and Green V World. Now, I know they teach us some mind-blowing stuff at these schools. Let's start with Red Pyramid World. Go to the next slide, please. Red Pyramid World looks pretty self-explanatory, and it also makes sense. To be the best, you gotta, well, be better. You gotta gain more knowledge, or you gotta gain more muscle mass, or you gotta get more reputation and street cred to continue climbing up, to continue getting better. And so, it would make sense, right, that that is also how you get to God. You got to get more brownie points. You got to pray more. You got to do more good works. And in theory, that's how you would get higher to God. But, but that is what like the disciples are thinking here. And we see that with Peter, James, and John. They saw Jesus at his most spiritual. They've never had a problem casting out a demon. And so, on the surface, those three look like they're pretty high up there on that pyramid. However, what Jesus is insinuating is something very different. Next slide. Introduce Green V World, where Jesus quite literally flips it on its head. And I think a quote that best summarizes this diagram is this. If we desire spiritual greatness, then what we truly desire is the task of service to others. And so we must deliberately choose the lowliest and most humble place. This was the whole key to the life of Jesus, for he came not to be served, but to be a servant. And notice how God is all the way at the bottom. As we heard, Jesus came to serve and not be served, and that is exactly why he is at the bottom of the V, because from there, it branches out to support everyone else. 
So, therefore, to be the best, you must serve the least. You can go to the next slide. Unless you guys want to look at my picture some more. Now that we better understand what it is that Jesus is saying here, why don't we do it? I can think of at least three excuses off the top of my head on why I don't serve the least. And maybe these three will ring true for you. My three excuses are that they don't deserve it, they should try harder, and I have better things to do. Let's start with the first example. They don't deserve it. I think this is the one that I slip into the most, and I think is the easiest to slip into. And a good example of this would be a homeless person on the side of the road. They literally are just sitting there. They're not doing anything. They don't contribute to my life in any meaningful way. They don't contribute to society. So why should I do anything? Why should I give them anything? They don't deserve it. And perhaps that is true. However, what does Jesus say? If you want to be first, you must serve the least. Although the logic of someone not deserving your help or anything like that is sound, when you bring God into those conversations, you get some pretty scary conclusions. Like, we don't deserve Jesus. We don't. There is no redeemable quality about us. Nothing except for one thing that God wants us. Our only redeemable quality isn't even from ourselves. That is both a bitter pill to swallow and yet also very uplifting statement. So yeah, maybe some people don't deserve your help, <clears throat> but we also don't deserve Jesus. And yet he came down to this earth and loves us freely. Therefore, to be the best you must serve the least. Let's go to the second excuse. They should try harder. I think a good example of this is a coworker. This coworker seems to be all over the place. They never seem to have all their stuff done on time, and they always seem very disorganized, and they come to you asking if you could help them out. And as you're hearing this, you're thinking to yourself, try harder. Maybe if you tried harder, maybe if you applied yourself more, developed a better work ethic, 
and got a little bit more organized, you would actually be able to get your work on time instead of asking me for help. Try harder. And perhaps, again, that is true. However, what does Jesus say? Anyone who wants to be first must serve the least. Again, the logic is very sound, but the godly conclusion is terrifying. There is nothing you can do. No amount of good work, no amount of hard work that you could do to accomplish salvation. As I preach these three services and we get to the time of confession and absolution, I can safely say that each time I get down on my knees, I have something to confess and be absolved of. That's crazy. I can't go a day without sinning. I can't even go a few hours without sinning. I desperately need Jesus. And yet there is nothing I can do. But yet Jesus comes down to us. Jesus tries and he succeeds and gives us this free gift of salvation. So yeah, there there are people that should try harder. But there is no amount of trying that you can do to accomplish salvation. And yet, Jesus gives you his hard-run races trophy, the trophy of eternal salvation. And all you have to do is believe. Therefore, to be the best, you must serve the least. And the last excuse, I think it's a pretty popular excuse, is I have better things to do great example of this a kid who sits alone at a lunch table they are alone they have no friends and they are sad and you get a small voice in the back of your head telling you that you should go sit with them but then you get another voice in your head that says You have better things to do. You have your own life to worry about. You have your own friends to sit with. You have your own mental health to worry about. And the list is ever expansive. You have better things to do than to sit with the kid who is all alone at the table. And perhaps that is true. What about God? Does God have better things to do than deal with us? We've got a whole world to run, a whole world to keep on spinning. We are but a drop in this vast bucket we call the earth, the universe, the galaxy, and beyond. I think God has more important things to do than deal with us. Let's let's push that envelope a little further. Did Jesus have better things to do than die on a cross?
Jesus, who is God, sits up in heaven and came down for us. And I don't know about you, but I think heaven is pretty awesome from what I've heard. And yet he comes down from heaven and dies for us. And again, I don't know about you, but there are a few people in this world that I would die for. I have better things to do. But not Jesus. Jesus came to this world and died for all people. So yeah, there may be better things for you to do, but God definitely had better things to do. Jesus definitely had better things to do. Yet he came to this world and died for us. Therefore, to be the best, you must serve the least. Because that is what the best, Jesus, did for us, the least. We see that in so much of what Jesus did in his earthly life. He healed lepers and people who were paralyzed when they didn't deserve his healing. The patience he had for his disciples when maybe if they just tried a little bit harder, they would have understood, yet Jesus had patience for them. Jesus sat with tax collectors and prostitutes, people who were on the fringe, when he definitely had better things to do. We also see this in Holy Week. Maundy Thursday, where he washes the disciples' feet. The teacher serving the student, God serving sinful man. As he came to serve and not be served. They definitely didn't deserve it. Good Friday. When the Sanhedrin came in and arrested him, and oh, the frustration. The Sanhedrin, the people who are supposed to know the scriptures so well, the ones who must have been so close, they must have been so close to understanding what Jesus was saying, who Jesus was. Yet they persecuted and gave him a life sentence. Death on a cross. And Jesus took that cross and carried it was pierced to it and died when he definitely had better things to do. That is what we are to do as well. As Jesus, who is the greatest, the best, served us the least, God serving sinful man, we are to serve the least as well. Whether that be a homeless person on the side of the road, a coworker who needs a little bit more help, or the kid who sits alone at the lunch table, we are to serve the least. For that is what the best did for us best serving the least, God serving sinful man, you and me. Amen.
in Christ Jesus and for all people, according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have taken us from all nations and united us in the body of your Son. Send your Holy Spirit to rid your children of all bitter jealousy, boasting, and selfish ambition. Fill the baptized with your wisdom that we may lead peaceable lives with sincerity and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uphold this world in your order. Preserve the church and the preaching of your word against all enemies. Bless our homes, that parents and children may serve one another faithfully and grow in instruction and faith until life's end. Give health and wisdom to all who serve in public office, that their authority may be exercised for the benefit of our people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your loving kindness, you do not abandon your children to suffer alone, but promise to care for all who call upon your name. Bless the homebound, the lonely, the depressed and anxious, those preparing for surgery, the ill and the dying, and especially those who desire and need our prayers. Janet Wigman, Jean Wells, Ben Bryant, Dennis Rickert, Marvin Beatty, Dan Human, Paul Huber, Pastor Bigness, Dennis Reed, Jack Arndt, Laura Bronis, Penny Perryman. Comfort all these your children in their distress. Heal their ills of body and soul, and grant them your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, grant that what we ask from you may not be squandered after our passions, but sought rightly in faith, that we may receive your good gifts and put them into service for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom.
same night on which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
body and blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in body and in soul, now and unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>